गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स एंड वेलकम बैक टू द थर्स डे इवनिंग पी जी टीचिंग सेशन ब्रॉड टू यू फ्रॉम सैन हॉस्पिटल मुंबई वी हैव टू केसेस टूडे एंड द फर्स्ट केस इज बींग प्रेजेंटेड बाय डॉक्टर ऋतुजा सो वी स्टार्ट विथ दिस केस एज वी हैव पुट अ मैसेज इन ऑल द स्टूडेंट ग्रुप्स फॉर द नेक्स्ट फ्यू वीक्स देर विल बी नो लाइव वेबकास्ट ऑफ दिस क्लासेस बिकॉज द हॉल इज अंडर रिपेयर so we will have a recorded version which we will be putting up on both the sites that is www.clinicalpediatrics.co.in and on diap so which can be accessed by viewers post the session and students who are in mumbai should try to come and attend it live so we start with the first case today a very good evening so 11 11 and a half year old boy second by birth order born of non consanguineous marriage muslim by religion sheikh by community resident of vikroli hailing from alabad uttar pradesh was brought by an informant being mother with complaints of one episode of paroxysmal event 6 days back child was apparently all right 6 days ago when he had one episode of convulsion in the form of blank staring look with deviation of angle of mouth towards the right side with twitching movements of the lips lasting for around 5 minutes subsided on itself followed by postictal drowsiness the child has a significant past history he was apparently all right till 8 years of age when he had trauma on the right leg while climbing on an iron staircase for which the mother applied a homemade herbal paste over the leg following which after 2 to 3 days he developed swelling of the right lower limb involving the entire leg below the knee and the toes associated with severe pain and was not able to bear weight on the right leg the skin over the leg was tense and shiny however no discoloration was seen there was no restriction of joint movements or swelling of the joints during this episode history of fever was present which was high grade and continuous in nature Two days later, child had one episode of convulsion in the form of blank staring look, deviation of angle of mouth associated with twitching movements of the eyes and lips, lasting for around five minutes, subsided by itself, followed by a postictal drowsiness. After which, the same day, mother noticed that the child had difficulty in standing on his own and had decreased movements of the left upper and the lower limb, which was sudden in onset, non-progressive. maximal at the onset involving the upper limb more than the lower limb in the form that the child was not able to lift his hand above the head and was unable to grasp the objects however was moving the hand along the bed he was able to lift the leg above the bed but mother noticed dragging of the left foot while walking and difficulty in holding slippers child was able to lift the head from the bed and roll over to side and was able to sit on his own there is no history suggestive of any cranial nerve involvement there was no history of any involuntary movements clumsiness of movements or abnormal movements of the eyeball no history of any numbness or tingling sensations to rule out sensory involvement no history of any bladder bubble involvement or excessive sweating palpitations flushing to rule out autonomic disturbances there was no history of any head and neck injury no history of any fever with cough weight loss or cox contact to rule out tuberculosis no history of any skin rash joint pain or swelling to rule out any connective tissue disorders no history of any painful finger digits or recurrent blood transfusions to rule out sickle cell disease no history of dyspnea or palpitations to rule out cardiac involvement however the mother noticed bluish discoloration of the nails and some pink to purple lesions on the palms and the soles few days after the leg swelling episode no history of any other bleeding manifestations to rule out prothrombotic states no history of any hematuria reduced urine output or facial puffiness to rule out uh, nephrotic and nephritic syndrome no history of any chronic drug intake no history of any immunization so for the above complaints child was admitted for a period of 3 months requiring icu stay wherein many blood and radiological investigations were done and was told to have some blood infection and some heart disease involving the valve for for which he received iv medications ct brain was done and was told to have some blood collection in the brain 
along with some infective collection for which a surgical procedure was done. He was later discharged on multiple oral drugs including anti-epileptic drugs and some blood thinners. Over a period of four years, the limb weakness has gradually improved, however not completely, and the child still has paucity of movements of the left side. Child is able to lift his hand over the head, but the grasp is still poor, and dragging of leg while walking is still present. Also, after all these episodes, mother noticed that the child gets tired easily on strenuous activity as compared to his peers, and thus avoids any such activities. ANC and birth history was normal. There was no history of any bluish discoloration of skin after birth, no history of any neonatal convulsions, no history of any NICU stay. It was a full-term home delivery, the birth weight being 2.5 kg. No prematurity, no low birth weight. Immunization-wise, catch-up immunization was given after five years of age according to the national immunization schedule. Developmentally, he is appropriate for age, studies in the fifth standard with an average scholastic performance. However, not much involved in sports activities. Also, the hearing and vision is normal. Dietary wise consumes mixed diet from family pot, takes three meals per day. Diet deficient in calories and proteins. Family history, no history of similar complaints in family, no history of sudden death in family. Socioeconomically belongs to lower middle class according to modified Kuppu Swami scale. Come on, so start analyzing what do you think happened after the trauma four years back? Achha, even oh yeah, actually presenting complaint today. thereafter and let's guess how we could have pro further progressed to ask the history. So just with that, what would be your impression? Uh, so, so only with this history, we are looking at an 11 and a half year old with one episode of a convulsion six days back. Uh, so first we want to know if uh, the simulogy has been described, we want to know if it is a provoked or an unprovoked convulsion and is it uh, a first episode or it is a uh, a case like a known seizure disorder who's had a convulsion. Suppose it's a first episode. Okay. Then how how would you how would you look at that? First episode. Okay. You ask the mother, have you had any seizure before? She said no, this is the first time. Then how would you go? Are there any associated risk factors uh, like m metabolic or uh, any degenerative or any structural uh, anomalies, uh, too late, too late for structural anomalies, too late for structural. Uh, first episode of a convulsion at 11 and a half year old, I am not thinking much on lines of metabolic. If it is unprovoked, then I would like to still keep epilepsy, um, like seizure disorder, uh, higher up than metabolic or degenerative and uh, as of now we don't know if it is a uh, and he has not had any prior convulsion so uh, then that also means just the age. Yes, so your approach should be any seizure first time is it acute symptomatic is it remote symptomatic or is it idiopathic okay obviously it's not acute symptomatic because there are no other symptoms then for remote symptomatic, you ask whether this child has had a neurological damage in the past. Whatever the damage, it could be static, it could be post-traumatic, so infective, we are not bothered. Stand here because he is oh, recording sorry. this way. And therefore, remote symptomatic, but remote symptomatic neurological. So you would have asked any neurological problem. And if not, then you start wondering whether it's an idiopathic. Now, what questions would you ask for a possible idiopathic? Acute symptomatic clear, remote symptomatic also clear. Because it's neither of the two, you call it idiopathic? That's not fair. 
Okay, so give a thought. What question you may ask, not necessarily you will get a clue, but you may as well. So who has a tendency for a seizure disorder? Family. Okay, so family history. So family history. If there is a family history, another is, is there a subtle brain dysfunction? He's not doing well at school, okay, for no reason. Okay, he studies, but doesn't do well. That means he has got some subtle brain damage, and it's not a normal brain, so it could be really a remote symptomatic, and I think that would have been there. Now, the point is, this is not an age for a first seizure, by and large, except idiopathic. So if it's not, then it has to be either remote symptomatic, it's not acute. So now you get the next story. Now analyze and the next. Before we go to that, suppose this was really the first seizure unprovoked and you don't find anything else in the history. What would be your approach? Would you start him on anti-epileptics? What would be your approach? We might think of any structural lesion, so uh, any radiological investigation might be needed. A structural lesion coming at this age. We would not start AED up front because it could be a type of a benign epilepsy like juvenile myoclonic epilepsy occurring at this age. So we might just see if there is any repeat episode, we might not start AEDs up front. We should assess the risk factors for future epilepsy if there is a family history or uh, maybe a developmental delay or something like that, then we are justified in starting AEDs. Otherwise, a first unprovoked seizure does not r really warrant. Anything else? We can plan an EEG if there is a repeat episode. I'm not sure of the exact indication, but we can keep so there are two parts to this. One is will you investigate and second is will you treat. Now both the things, what is there in your mind? What are you trying to do or decide? You are trying to decide what are the chances of this one having a second seizure. That is what you are trying to decide. So you have to ask yourself will a imaging and or a EEG give you an answer to that is he going to get a second seizure that is one part which will decide whether you want to do the investigation or no and based on that you will decide whether you want to treat him or no right so how will you do do, do, do these things tell you exactly what are the chances of him having a second seizure will a eg tell you that will a mri tell you that an EEG can tell us that if he has an epilepsy syndrome, then there is a chance of a repeat convulsion. But okay. uh, a normal MRI may or may not. Uh, okay, anything else? Even a normal ECG would not rule out the future risk of epilepsy. Very good. So I think whenever there is a first seizure like this, you must know the details of a seizure. Well, that's a seizure all right. How are you sure that it is not a focal with a generalization? If it was focal with generalization, you have to investigate. Imaging. But, so you must ask exactly how did the seizure start? What was he doing prior to seizure, during seizure and after seizure? So whenever you get such a history, it's clear that it's a seizure. Why is it not a pseudo seizure? Are we sure it's not a pseudo seizure? There are many types of pseudo seizures and we unnecessarily start thinking about seizure disorder. Are you sure it's not a pseudo seizure? How will you make sure or, or even in this case, how will you know that it's not a pseudo seizure? So talk about the features of a pseudo seizure and then you'll automatically know. Pseudo seizure happens once in life or how many times? Usually a secondary benefit is associated with a pseudo seizure. Secondary postictal drowsiness points more towards a seizure than a pseudo seizure. Okay. Injuries may be sustained during a seizure but not during a pseudo seizure. Okay. Pseudo seizures never occur in s during sleep. Okay. Occur more during people. Occurs around people when there are more people. No boil bl uh, bladder incontinence. 
no bowel bladder okay so the difference between a focal seizure and a general seizure is that the focal seizure has some clue to the patient that he is going to get a seizure okay so even and means an aura, aura is a sign of focality and therefore we must ask what different types of aura can happen did you suddenly feel that there is something in your head did you see something black in or in front of the eyes okay did you feel like nausea or vomiting prior to it if that is so then if there is an aura it is focal seizure which becomes generalized so fast that the parents have not noticed now the question is if neither the patient may recall it nor the observers may have seen it therefore we go by the rest of the thing that you talked about deciding whether there is a thing but i think aura is an important issue and aura may come from any part of the cortex not necessarily a motor cortex okay it could be temporal it could be occipital it could be parietal and therefore some feeling of numbness or some feeling sensations as if hands are going on my hand and then i had it so that aura must be asked for now we know that this is possibly a remote symptomatic now we will look at this next slide and see how uh, the whole thing has evolved and we will understand One what has slide. happened to this okay so now what do you think happened after the trauma some 4 years back ni what do you think this is happening secondary osteomyelitis induced by trauma secondary osteomyelitis so but they are not saying that there is any pain in the bone or anything so how do you know this osteomyelitis it can be cellulitis because there was swelling history of fever was there and it was progressive correct so now cellulitis or osteomyelitis or both it is after trauma why why cellulitis or so let's let's leave the fever out. fever has come later on this statement okay you have seen this child immediately after he fell down there was a swelling fine it could be a subcutaneous tissue it could be muscle injury the most common hematoma okay why why did it take 2 3 days to develop swelling does it give you some idea when i fall down in the next few hours there is a swelling i hit my head immediately there may not be a swelling but in the next 2 3 hours there is a swelling Uh, could it be some thrombus <coughs> it's an injury with complication okay that's why it has taken 2 3 days could it be a complication that this is a hemophilic person and therefore the blood started accumulating after a even minor trauma and now you have a swelling could it be hemophilic if it's a girl that i'm afraid but whatever bleeding this um sir uh, the trauma is uh, not that trivial also as it is during some iron staircase which has been hurt and the swelling is below involving the entire leg below the knees and the toes it is not localized to a joint to be an arthropathy uh, means but better reason why it's not a hemophilia uh, yeah. earlier presentation earlier Age presentation is. the presentation age wise earlier okay anything else for this event there is sir just now answered it for this event why it is not a hemophilia forget earlier presentation and all that yes swelling after 2 3 days why in hemophilia there should be a swelling within minutes or hours right besides all the other points okay so then it's an infection as a complication okay and we know cellulitis or osteomyelitis after all bone is not fractured hopefully okay so why osteomyelitis cellulitis so so uh, here there is obviously an injury so following a known injury you will take cellulitis first 
but having said that if some child comes with what looks like cellulitis but there is no such history of a injury a day or two or three prior then it is an indicator of underlying osteomyelitis and i think younger the child cellulitis is osteomyelitis till proved otherwise but not in a little older child not in an adult but in a younger child yes maybe in the first two three years osteomyelitis presents as cellulitis only to us and we don't understand that the infection has started from deeper area and has come out rather than first cellulitis and then extended to the bone so th we will have to consider that and the only way is how severe is the pain how high is the fever how sick is the child okay but either way in both infection the child would exactly look very sick so we will have to keep that in mind okay so there is some post traumatic complication and and why should complication happen it's a closed injury right closed injury and complication i thought open injury causes complication do you think closed injury causes so infection? that compartment syndrome it's a closed compartment uh and therefore any hematoma would be a good needles for any germ to be there but where is the germ germ has to come from outside no when there is an open wound there is a germ coming from outside this is a closed wound no germ will come skin is a good barrier so why should infection occur so answer is bacteria are all the time in our body waiting to pounce our immune system keeps them under control and where are the bacteria pathological bacteria in our body in the nose in the throat on the skin in the gi tract and therefore they are waiting for a chance there is no chance and your immune system is good but if your immune system goes down or if there is a chance that means a blood collection injury then they pounds so you don't have to have an open wound you may still get infection right okay now after this uh, he got a seizure right two days later he had a seizure so now what do you make out of this seizure after he has developed osteomyelitis she has developed osteomyelitis oblique cellulitis so are they connected or unconnected you have seen meningitis okay have you seen meningitis with other primary infection have you seen pneumonia with meningitis typhoid with meningitis or meningitis usually is by itself uh, secondary meningitis can occur so does uti will lead to meningitis no what sir is asking is in any meningitis that you have seen did you find an infection in another organ two major organs within a same time have you seen that if not then this is unrelated unless the cause of seizure is not infective but non infective how do you how do you discuss that you agree that you have not seen two major infections coming almost together one after another within a few days but this has happened here so could it be electrolyte imbalance could it be he is not he feeding and he has not had enough glucose so it's hypoglycemic do you think it's a septic okay so what must be the cause in this case with osteomyelitis with fever sepsis may be one of the causes multi so organ answer is if there is a bacteremic condition it could go anywhere if it's a localized infection then it will be contained and not allowed to spread easily unless there is a severe immune deficiency otherwise not and an immune deficiency patient does come with multiple sites severe bacterial infection but not otherwise but a bacteremic one does that now here there is an injury there is already an exposure to blood so there is a likelihood that it may spread anywhere 
and therefore it's likely it has spread there. But we must also discuss whether without infection into the neurological system, could it be non-infective seizure? So even, even in the infection that has supposed spread to the brain, so what are yes, we talking of? Sit on. We, can, we have to go up and down, but otherwise we will keep standing. We can there. try and dissect. So if a, if a infection has spread, are we saying that he has now developed meningitis? Or he has developed a brain abscess? Or are we saying something else, if it is related to the infection? What do you think with this story? So in other words, take this story as it is. What is the anatomy? What is the pathology of this story only? Forget that earlier story. A cortical uh, involvement. Okay, so cortical involvement. Uh, Generalized it's or focal. localized? Fo focal. Because because there is left upper lobe and uh, upper limb and lower limb weakness. Correct. So he's got a hemiparesis. Hemiparesis. A seizure followed by a hemiparesis. So this is a, like a classic stroke. So is it generalized or localized? One area is involved. Now, if it was generalized, what would have happened? No, no, more than quadriparesis, say change of sensorium Altered and all sense. that would have happened. Na? See, there is no description of that na, after the seizure. Right? Okay. So, so what is the pathology? An embolus, maybe. So, vascular. So, you come to vascular. Now, it could be thrombosis, embolism, whatever. Now you branch out into both whether that infection is related or as sir said if it is unrelated what could it be, right? So what I am trying to say is this is not the story of him developing meningitis out of that sepsis or not developed a brain abscess out of that. It could be a septic embolus or then it is an unrelated thromboembolic phenomenon, right? Now, why would he get a septic embolus? Do you need something else to get a septic embolus? Or that embolus can reach the brain? Yes? Huh? Some predisposing factor like an underlying heart disease. What kind of heart disease? Some septal defect or synoptic congenital. Huh? Paradoxical. Shunt. Any shunt lesion. So there has to be a communication from where this embolus goes across the heart to the arterial side. That has to, there has to be a communication there. So there has to be some previous heart defect. Which heart defect will be asymptomatic till now? ASD. ASD, right? So that is one scenario. Now talk about the other scenario which sir is asking. Can it be unrelated to that infection? Both the episodes are closely related, Matlab, within days of injury the child has developed this. So it could be the complication of the yeah. So theoretically it could be separate, but since they are so close to each other, you would like to correlate the two, right? I think the acute onset vascular problem could be immune, could be metabolic, could be a, a congenital malformation in the vessel which suddenly bled. None of them exists on the history to suggest that and therefore it must be related. If it's related, then it has to be and every vasculitis is, every vascular lesion is thrombosis, embolism, hemorrhage, vasculitis or vasculospasm. Vasculospasm could be in some metabolic disorders. Okay. Vasculitis, multiple reasons, rheumatological, immune, and then of course thrombosis, embolism, some source and an hemorrhage, either congenital malformation like aneurysmal or injury, whatever. So this is a vascular problem and in a child who has an infection and therefore it's easy to call it vasculitis. It may have set up through thrombosis, 
coming from some source and if that is the source, it should have gone into the pulmonary circuit but it has gone on the other side. Therefore, that has to be right to left shunt. If it's a right to left shunt, this child must be having a cyanotic heart and which cyanotic heart can be nearly asymptomatic at this age. ASD, yes. But ASD is left to right. Why should a embolus go from right to left? So it has to be a right to left. So would there be any cyanotic heart which remains as symptomatic till 10, 11 years of age? And my clue is which cyanotic heart looks may look like an ASD? May look like an ASD, even on examination. And the what answer, looks like answer ASD? is No, no, what looks like ASD? Come on. Partial connections of abnormally vessels. Pulmonary veins opening on the right side, partial. Okay. And often supracardiac. Infracardiac are usually very severe. So partial connections can behave like this and almost like a ping phallus the mild cyanosis can be easily overlooked okay and that looks almost on your examination also like heart is normal okay there's no clue to that and just keep all that in mind okay surely there would be a symptoms though may not be picked up and the symptoms are usually getting tired okay they may not have picked up cyanosis, but if you ask them, has he been running about? They said, no, no, he, he likes to be sedentary because he says, no, I, I get tired. So you get some story like that. The point is, your history should be guided, questions in the history should be guided by what you are thinking. And if you are thinking here, I must rule out a congenital heart disease, either cyanotic or cyanotic, my questions would be related to that. Right? Okay. So now he is recovered from this partially, you are saying. No? Now it's four years later. What is that bluish discoloration of nails and pink purple lesions? So it looks like he has a cyanotic heart disease. Yeah. See, we discussed that. It's a cyanotic heart disease, okay. Now, fairly older child, no other symptoms, I suppose, prior to that. So possibly not. Then could it be a peripheral cyanosis? After all, there is a sepsis. Child could be in shock, septic shock. Periphery is blue, okay. And the mother says, yes, I saw blueness. And it's acquired last minute. So what do you think? Or is it still possible a cyanotic heart disease? You have to be totally negligent to miss a cyanotic heart at that age. Totally negligent. I don't think any mother can be negligent at all. So we can be negligent, not the mother. So we will not believe that she has missed cyanosis. So this is not a congenital cyanotic. Then what? Acquired cyanosis. Metabolglobinemia acquired. Give a thought. Okay. So you will have to ask more questions to figure that out. No, there is a only peripheral cyanosis, not central cyanosis for like acquired methemoglobinemia. Then again, first episode, and uh, she has noticed this discoloration few days after the leg swelling. So means. Yeah, no so suppose it is peripheral, what does that mean? When do you get peripheral cyanosis? Sluggish, blood flow. Sluggish ah, blood flow. So which is what? Shock. Shock. Or thrombosis, but in one finger or all fingers? Thrombosis in all fingers. It's difficult. Capil no? Small huh? capillary. It's only not bluish discoloration, something else happening. How do you connect that 
reddish some lesions splinter hemorrhages or splinter hemorrhages in the nails okay what else janve lesions of okay janve lesions okay what else so i'm just saying for thinking sake what you would have asked is that that bluish discoloration did it remain did it go away you are talking of a infective condition he could be having high fever with chills it could be just that for half an hour at the time of that peripheral vasoconstriction he has bluish fingertips so you have to ask all that right so that is one then you said shock so you would ask about sensorium at that time whether the sensorium was affected then he could be in shock at that time right okay and otherwise those pink purple lesions on it, palms and soles see there are some purple lesion could it be now this is going to be a bacterial endocarditis i get some lesions i get clubbing acute okay maybe cyanosis do you think it's a bacterial endocarditis we are looking after all a severe bacteremic condition and then we might say it could be primarily without a heart disease or with a heart disease both are possible what what's your comment on could it be a bacterial endocarditis could be you know it causes skin rash okay it causes clubbing okay so is it all right after all clubbing and cyanosis is same no she is saying yeah it could be could be bacterial endocarditis cyanosis is not a symptom cyanosis is not a symptom but then i thought clubbing and cyanosis go together no so Because do you get any situation disease. where one is without the other uh, cyanotic heart disease both no clubbing and cyanosis then so tell us tell us when do you get cyanosis without clubbing ha huh. so cystic fibrosis you will get what clubbing without cyanosis okay and cyanosis without clubbing meth hemoglobinemia anything else any which is acute cyanosis with acute acute shock. cyanosis okay acute cyanosis acute respiratory meth hemoglobin whatever okay that will not be with that hb uh, does not cause cyanosis but cause clubbing acute illness causing clubbing i thought clubbing is a chronic hypoxia okay chronic respiratory problem congenital cyanotic chronic isn't it how can an acute bacterial endocarditis sub acute cause clubbing does does a cirrhosis cause clubbing yes, yes. then where is hypoxia i thought in subacute genesis of clubbing is hypoxia subacute no subacute subtle infection for long time will subacute infection for a long time the pathogenesis of clubbing is hypoxia one but changes in the peripheral vasculature and that happens sometimes in an acute bacterial endocarditis or that may happen in chronic liver disease where a vasculature changes occur at the periphery and you know that if there is no supply going there then it would look almost getting hypoxic it will even have an acute clubbing so pathogens of clubbing is not only hypoxia and that's why in some other condition not commonly you can't say there is not cirrhosis because there is no clubbing don't misunderstand that but sometimes it still could be so then finally we say that this may not be really a cyanotic heart disease we are talking about okay it could be maybe shock we will have to get into all the details fine go ahead so now heart disease and iv medication okay so and long time so it must be a bacterial endocarditis okay but not cyanosis really it could be multiple reasons coming up okay so yeah. okay so now uh, 
it has gradually improved over four years, but there is some deficit still. Okay, and he gets tired easily on strenuous activity. Go ahead. Okay. So now how will you summarize everything, all of you? Try, then we'll tell her to summarize. So, eight-year-old boy with, uh, huh? sorry, eleven and a half, eleven and a half-year-old boy uh, with uh, uh, I mean, acute onset uh, 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 convulsion. So now you have to, when you are summarizing, you have to convert everything into interpretations and processes rather than just the symptom, right? So, a 11 and a half year old boy okay. has now presented with a paroxysmal event with a past history of stroke. stroke. But even before the stroke something was there, uh, no? Bacteremia. Huh? Uh, with a past history of trauma rela related cellulitis oblique osteomyelitis which was soon followed by a stroke, mm. correct? And now what has happened over time that, that uh, uh, hemiplegia has improved and now he has got another seizure, right? This is the summary in short. So now, tell us. So is a case of left-sided hemiparesis with a cortical lesion involving right MCA, probular vascular etiology, embolic. So, so now where is the embolus coming from? It could be from the heart. Like so that's because you know that there is a heart, heart disease, disease, you can say it is coming from the heart because it's already been diagnosed as a heart disease, right? Though clinically we didn't have very strong reasons to suspect any heart disease in this child, right? Excuse me, sir. No, just guess, yeah, you want to do say something. So the current uh, convulsion would be attributed to the uh, embolic phenomenon? The but there is no because other new onset focal neurological deficit for the embolus, no, just the convulsion. There is no onset. So, yeah, so in fact, see all that heart disease and all was four years back, no? So the point is that that time if it was treated, then today, whether it's still there, whether it has recurred, all those issues are there. And I think all that we know is that there has been an earlier neurological damage so any seizure suddenly appearing after some previous neurological damage would be called as a remote symptomatic till you prove that it is not related. So we'll call it a remote symptomatic. We have no clear idea what exactly must have happened at that time, but there could have been another small embolus which damaged some small area and now that's throwing up an epileptogenesis which means it takes time to develop a seizure disorder and now that has happened. Okay. I want you to guess what must be the weight and height of this child. I'll give you a clue. Why is this 11 year old child getting into all these complications? Trauma, local osteomyelitis, sepsis, bacterial endocarditis, don't you think it's too much unkind by the nature to throw such a severe illness out of a mere injury? Why is that? What is sir hinting at? Predisposing, Predisposing not immunodeficiency mm -hmm. but nutritional nutrition. Okay, so either the host is abnormal and that is nutrition. But can the host be normal and still this happens? 
and no immune deficiency. Very, Host is normal. A very virulent organism. And therefore, the organism is very, very virulent. And uh, it could be a staph going very fast. Okay. So, either the host is abnormal or the organism was uh, virulent. So, but organism seems to have done well with whatever antibiotic there. So, possibly this child must not have been fairly nourished. Okay. And that's our impression. Let's see the... On general examination, the child was average built, conscious, oriented to time place person, lying comfortably on the bed in supine position with the left upper arm adducted, prone and flexed and the left lower limb adducted and external. Patient is there? No, sir. Okay. Left lower limb adducted and externally rotated. A febrile with a temperature of 37.6 degrees Celsius. A pulse rate of 1110 per minute, regular, normal volume, character, no radio radial or radio femoral delay. All the peripheral pulses and central pulses were well filled. Respiratory rate of 20 per minute, regular. Blood pressure of 110 by 70 millimeters of mercury, falling between 58 to 90th centile, which was taken in the supine position in the right upper limb. Saturation was 99% on room air. Anthropometrically, currently the child has a weight of 38 kg, falling between plus 1 to plus 2 standard deviation, a height of 137 cm, between median and plus 1 standard deviation, and a BMI of 20.3 between plus 1 to plus 2 standard deviation. Anthropometrically normal. Head to toe examination, there is a scar of previous surgery. 10 cm linear scar over the right temporoparietal region, no obvious facial dysmorphism, ear, nose, eyes normal, oral cavity normal, no dental caries, throat normal, wasting of the left upper and the lower limb present, also positive of movements noted on the left side, chest and abdomen normal, back and spine normal, no skeletal anomalies, no contractures, no skin and hair changes, no neurocutaneous markers, genitalia normal, also no stigmata of infective endocarditis. On systemic examination, central nervous system, higher mental functions, child is right-handed, was conscious, oriented to time, place, person, no abnormality was found in speech, memory, intelligence, judgment and emotional status. No abnormality was detected in the cranial nerve examination. Motor system examination between the right and the left side when we compared the left side was wasted the tone was increased on the left upper limb and the lower limb power on the left side was 4 by 5 on the right side was 5 by 5 lower limb power on the left side was 4 by 5 and on the right side was 5 by 5 reflexes on the left side superficial reflexes were present planter was extensor on the right side, they were present and the plantar is flexor. Reflexes on the left side were brisk and on the right side were normal. Sensory system was within normal limits. There were no cerebellar signs, no autonomic nervous system involvement. The spine and cranium was normal. There were no meningeal signs. Also, gait, uh, circumduction gait was present with dragging of the left leg. On cardiovascular system examination, uh, chest wall symmetrical, apical impulse was seen in the left fifth intercostal space in the mid clavicular line. No other visible veins, scars, sinuses, no other visible pulsations. On palpation, the inspectory findings were confirmed. Apex beat was felt at the left sixth intercostal space, 1.5 cm lateral to the mid clavicular line. A hyperdynamic thrill was present. On auscultation, both the heart sounds were present over the mitral area. A high pitched pan systolic murmur of uh, grade 3, best third over the left parasternal lesion radiating to the axilla was present and rest of the systemic examination was normal, respiratory system, air entry, bilaterally equal, clear, per abdomen soft, non-tender, no organomegaly. Okay, go back, means uh, one is to the CVS signs, Sorry? Sa signs, signs, okay, come to your wasting. Yeah. So, wasting is a sign of LMN or UMN? LMN. 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 
So this child has a LMN palsy. Disuse atrophy. Disuse. So LMN wasting is immediate or acute and UMN wasting is after a long time. This is four year old. So over a period of time this child has got wasting, right? So that's one. Go to the CVS signs. Power is nearly normal in both sides, no? So why should there be any atrophy of the muscles? Power is normal. So he's moving. And if he's moving, why there is so much of difference in the size of left and right? Don't you think that is not accepted? The preference to use the right hand would be more so. So the point is that that recovery has happened only lately thereafter. For six months, one year, there was no recovery at all, no physiotherapy, whatever natural occurred. Now you are seeing a reasonable good power. And therefore that is why there is an atrophy on one side. It must not have been well managed earlier, right? Let's look at CVS. So, interpret these signs, CVS. Cardiomegaly is present. Huh? Cardiomegaly is present along with the volume overload. Okay. Therefore, we are getting a hyperdynamic thrill with the uh, pants. So, cardiomegaly due to which ventricle? Due to the left, left ventricle. Left. Okay, so left ventricle, hypertrophy. Then what else? Volume overload. Okay, so volume overload of left ventricle is due to what? Means what can cause volume overload of the left ventricle or what signs are there here? Yeah, so suggest what? VSD. Regurgitant lesion. Mitral regurgitant lesion. Okay. So rheumatic. Mitral regurgitant rheumatic. Commonest cause is rheumatic, no? So agreed? It could be post endocarditis. So could be post damage due to that endocarditis as well, right? So you don't have any history of rheumatic that doesn't rule out rheumatic. So nothing prevents it from being rheumatic but you also mm -hmm. argue that it might well be damaged due to that uh, lesion, right? What are the other pathologies which cause mitral regurgitation? After all, mitral, mitral regurgitation is a valvular disorder. One is rheumatic fever. <coughs> Another is any post-infective, even any myocarditis, viral, because there is no separate myocarditis, there is an endomyocarditis, okay. So one is infection of all kind. Anything else? Marfan's, so what happens in Marfan's? There is mitral valve prolapse and ultimately there is damage to the valves leading to mitral regurgitation. So, in fact, any connective disorder, connective tissue disorder, Marfan's is one typical one, okay. Could it be simply a mitral valve prolapse? It could be that too, okay. It has a wide spectrum, many of them are asymptomatic, okay. And this could be asymptomatic. If this was a significant mitral rigors to start with, child would not have been totally asymptomatic. So this is something that has happened now or it must have been a mitral rigors which is asymptomatic by its own nature and that's like an MVP itself. So we keep all that in mind and we will know only on subsequent follow-up whether this is etc. Right? Yeah. The final impression is a 11-year-old boy is a case of acute non-progressive left-sided hemiparesis with a cortical lesion involving the right middle cerebral artery territory, probably vascular in etiology, embolic, with uh, mitral regurgitation, secondary to infective endocarditis, currently in sinus rhythm without any signs of congestive cardiac failure or failure, in a birth and a developmentally normal, partially immunized child. In this diagnosis, you have not explained why he got a seizure now. 
so it could be because of many causes like uh, the child has grown up it could be because of missed doses or improper doses or it could be some other embolic phenomenon also but no other new onset focal neurological deficit no altered sensorium during that time it was just a small unit missed doses of ad okay okay and uh, Something else I was going to. Huh, why? Why cortical? Why not uh, internal capsule? So cortical because first of all, a focal lesion like a left-sided hemiparesis along with it, a convulsion is present. Though there are no other like memory or speech disturbances are not there, but most likely a cortical lesion because if it would have been an internal capsule, we would have expected a dense uh, lesion, a dense hemiplegia, along with other things like. Uh, hemi anesthesia like hemi homonymous hemi anesthesia and all mostly a cortical lesion okay go on investigations have been done so investigations at that time few of the investigations are available so this was a 2d echo which was done uh, which was suggestive of uh, 5 into 3 mm vegetation attached on the mitral lef uh, valve leaflet with a perforation of a2 segment of the anterior uh, mitral leaflet with a mild TR, a severe eccentric MR and a mild pH. A CT brain was done. This was the initial CT brain which was done and this was suggestive of few areas of intraparenchymal hemorrhages in the right frontoparietal region with surrounding vasogenic edema and mass effect could represent a hemorrhagic infarct. Another uh, investigation was done, a repeat CT uh, was done and this Actually, this was an MR angiogram and this was suggestive of a non-enhancing complete lumen occluding thrombus involving the second and the third part of the left subclavian artery and first part of the left axillary artery. Along with this, multiple irregular walled peripherally enhancing lesions in the right frontoparietal region, few of these lesions coalescing to form larger lesion, was suggestive of an abscess formation, secondary to a septic emboli. So a uh, decompressive craniotomy was done and the extraction was done and the child's blood culture repeatedly grew MRSA. So IV antibiotics were continued for a prolonged period of time. Mm -hmm. This is the recent X-ray, cardiomegaly and Read the X-ray. Uh, this is a chest X-ray frontal view. All the... Mm, other bony and soft tissue markings are uh, uh, normal. Thoda, it is overexposed. The trachea being central in position. The cardiac cell out. Uh, the left, there is straightening of the left heart border along with slight uh, increase. Cardiomegaly is present and along with slight increase in the pulmonary venous markings. The costophrenic, cardiophrenic angles are clear. Okay. Fine. Go ahead. It's Done? Fine. Okay. Fine. Any questions? Uh, sir, uh, where, uh, do we start uh, anti epileptics in this case? Or was it started in the previous? It was an acute symptomatic, uh, there was a reason behind the uh, convulsion, so is it justified to start AED back then? What do you all think? There is an infarct, there is an ADUS, it is like a structural abnormality. It would have come further repeatedly risk of other, uh, another seizure. If AED was not started, it would have come repeatedly then. Sorry, if AD? If AD was not started, then it would have come repeatedly. So how long would you give? We can do repeat imaging and see whether that needles has reduced or any, uh, if there is uh, no calcification left there. If the repeat is normal, repeat imaging is almost normal, we can try tapering and stop. So no calcification does not mean that it that area will not shoot off or trigger off again, no? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, that is not a good enough reason to decide whether to continue or not to continue. Sorry? So which is the standard way you proceed that if patient is seizure free for two years or whatever. So what do you do in a head injury? Do you start seizure medication or you don't? Head injury with the, if there is uh, finding, uh, if there is hemorrhage, if there is, if there is hemorrhage or some, uh, if there is infarct present then we continue for at least two years and the ch then we see again with the in, in see imaging, imaging we see whether it has resolved or not. Yeah, I think uh, there has been a long interval between the first episode and now a seizure. So the epileptogenesis period is very long. So the question is, is it worth putting this child on next two, three years of anticonvulsant? We are not very sure. Sir, he was put last time yeah. and he is asking was that right, should no, we So have? the question is that generally there are clear indications on head injuries. Okay, how long to give AED and that is only three to six months and nothing beyond. Because thereafter, any time in life you might throw up a seizure but that does not justify a long treatment to begin with. Same thing should be there for any acquired neurological or symptomatic seizure. So I suppose it was not right to give a long-term treatment but possibly only for about three months and then take away. Telling the parents that this may happen any time in life, even 20 years down the line maybe. And at that time we will have to assess the risk of a frequent recurrence. If there has been a long interval between seizure episodes, then you may try not to give a long-term treatment and keep, today you have an immediate prophylaxis available, okay, in case there is a sudden, not prophylaxis, but control, and therefore we should not err on giving a long-term treatment if possible, right? So I think that's the way to go by. So we now move on to the second case that is being presented by Dr. Gokulan. Good evening, everyone. Nine year old girl, third by birth order, born by non consensus marriage, resident of Kurla, hailing from UP, Muslim by religion, bought by parents with chief complaints of yellowish discoloration of eyes since seven months. Patient was apparently alright 
seven months back when mother noticed yellowish discoloration of eyes which progresses over next 3 days to involve the entire body for the above complaints patient was admitted in kasturba hospital but took doma due to personal reasons yellowish discoloration was persistent but did not consult any physician for last seven months one week back child developed fever for which child has taken to some private hospital where investigations were sent and was referred to synonymously in view of jaundice on enquiry history of itching all over the body history of passage of high colored urine no history of clay colored stools no history of abdominal distension no history of alter sleep pattern involuntary movements no history of bleeding from any site no history of any chronic drug intake no history of joint pain no history of rash no history of abdominal pain vomiting no history of similar complaints in the past no history of blood transfusion no history of blood related disorders in family no history of liver related disorders in family past history no history of previous hospital admissions history of recurrent lrt was there and requiring nebulization on opd basis two day ago done at four years of age uh, suggestive of iot stenosis no active management and further ANC history registered pregnancy uh, all scans for normal ANC was uneven full birth history full term normal vaginal delivery cried immediately after birth no history of any cyst no history of neonatal jaundice immunization history immunized till date according to national immunization schedule developmental history developmentally appropriate for age family history uh, no other members of the family are affected by this disorder wait go back chill what is your thought process and approach 9 year old with jaundice for last 7 yellowish discoloration for last 7 months so you heard the onset right so what is your thought process acute viral hepatitis that has become chronic why not childhood had had history of uh, hepatitis like picture abdo pain uh, vomiting and uh, would have been res- would resolve uh, with jaundice won't be this so one is the onset did not start with there's no description of nausea vomiting prodrome anything like that which is common with acute hepatitis acute infectious hepatitis and the second is that it would resolve it wouldn't stay this much so again primarily is it hepatobiliary or is it hematological so uh, means uh, history wise this is an otherwise normal child means well child till now who has developed yellowish discoloration since the last 7 months without any other associated features like for it to be hemolytic uh, there are no like uh, waxing waning episodes of jaundice so by and large it looks like a hepatobiliary only which has been means chronic since 7 months and appearing for the first time at like 8 years of any other reason why it's not hemolytic mother would have noticed a uh, paleness okay mother would have noticed pallor biggest 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 reason why it is not hemolytic come on so it could be g6 pd no took some medicine 7 months back and became g6 pd and hemolysis persistence of symptoms for 7 months chalo yaar big 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 what kind of jaundice you get in hemolysis unconjugated and what kind of jaundice is this conjugated you don't said what nonsense you are talking you should have told me that right so out hemolytic is out so now coming to hepatobiliary now hepatic or biliary come on come on we should all talk and that's the way we we'll learn i heard something why hepatic 
you may be right so tell us why no pale stools for bellary there is no pale stools guys tree no pale stools so in all biliary jaundice do we need a pale stool we don't need complete obstruction in all biliary jaundice na so that's not a strong reason against biliary high color urine that's part of conjugated so that can happen in hepatic and biliary both any other thoughts come on so itching suggests what so primarily itching suggests what deposition of bile acids in the skin right so which is conjugated hyperbilirubinemia it can again happen in both biliary as well as long standing hepatic because there is a deposition of conjugated i mean of those bile acids right so that alone doesn't suggest that this is primary pathology is biliary so how do we in general decide whether it's hepatic or biliary in general then we will come back to this case and see how best we can what associated features in hepatic disease there will be a uh, loss of appetite failure to gain weight uh, a more sick child than a biliary patient very good so we first discussed that we came to hepatic from hemolytic in we ruled out hemolytic then we said this is not acute hepatic so now you said that in chronic hepatic hepatocyte disease there has to be some other suggestion of subtle sickness what about chronic biliary is there something like a chronic biliary sclerosing cholangitis sclerosing cholangitis primary biliary cirrhosis primary biliary cirrhosis so how are those patients happy sick patients right so that is not unlikely can it be cholelocal cyst first came up 7 months back and is now just there other other features of liver cell failure like up down distension ascites should be there in hepatic hepatic yeah. thing correct so ideally they should be there in chronic liver disease apparently from this history there's nothing right so i am asking can it be any chronic biliary problem so we have to think first of all are there any biliary problems which can remain constant for 7 months or no and then see whether this can be any of those so can it be a cholelocal cyst can it be a gallstone can it be pfic it can be a uh, obstructive a slowly progressive obstructive lesion uh, because the jaundice is also uh progressive not resolving so yeah so obstructive lesion where biliary tract biliary atresia no no so what i am trying to say is that you he, you know the picture given to us is that he is a well child so we are tempted to call it non hepatocyte and biliary but i can't think of a biliary pathology which will remain constant for 7 months it has to change so all classic triad of cholelocal cyst is what textbook description intermittent jaundice pain so the word is intermittent correct so cholelocal cyst is intermittent benign recurrent cholestasis is recurrent okay gallstones must have pain and it can't just stay there for 7 months so i can't think of any biliary pathology pfic and all are very progressive and they wouldn't come for the first time at this so then you have to go back to chronic liver disease and probably see whether are there any subtle manifestations or 
which which liver disease will have long standing jaundice but no other dysfunction are there any liver disease which has long standing jaundice but no other dysfunction patient is fine happy playful can play cricket also football chronic also chronic hepatitis chronic hepatitis B. okay compensated anything else enzyme deficiencies no enzyme deficiencies can have jaundice but they have no other problem right what is against that age hmm? age of onset and severity of jaundice we are being told that this is you know significant jaundice whereas those have just mild jaundice which maybe parent complains intelligent parent or we incidentally observe right so this is not that also so maybe we are missing something in the history which could favor a chronic uh, hepatocyte disease can we see the next slide please Now, why this jaundice is progressing within three days to all over the body? What does that mean? I can understand jaundice slowly worsening over time, but he says within three days the whole body was yellow. At that time, it may have been a viral hepatitis. So, you, your inference is it's a fastly worsening disease. What disease we will see later, but fastly worsening disease. That within three four days the whole body is yellow, very unusual, but fastly developing. That much we knew. Acute onset, fastly developing jaundice. Okay, but thereafter, the child took dama but remained well, no. So here is a fastly developing illness. fastly worsening and at home not even consulting the doctor what kind of disorder that must be you get my point funny isn't it somebody who gets severe breathlessness within 2 3 days and five fever like pneumonia and he said i'll go dama and i'll be happily staying at home for the next few months and the jaundice has not cleared okay so at that stage of time we like to know whether the jaundice was receding by itself okay that's important story if the jaundice was due to hepatocyte disorder at that time and it was worsening then either some worsening hepatocyte disease got naturally controlled and the jaundice started going down and the parents said anyway you are all right good stay at home and then we don't know whether the jaundice remained but much lower intensity and therefore they stayed at home for 7 days okay and thereafter when they consulted somebody he said no no you still have jaundice so i imagine the detailed history would possibly be in this child that initially in the first 4 5 days the jaundice worsened very fast thereafter it started settling down by itself and then remained at a low level for a long time till somebody for some reason took the child and he said no no you better investigate the jaundice is still not there so now tell me what kind of pathology and etiology are we discussing when acute onset severely worsening in the few days remaining controlled naturally getting less severe but still persisting what kind of infection is ruled out sorry okay. gilbert syndrome so that's what we discussed about the enzyme deficiencies 
uh, in those cases, only if there is infection, the child may have jaundice. In other times, they will have persistent mild jaundice. So, yeah, you are right. So, you are saying that at that time, he had some infection. That's why it was more. Right? You are thinking of that. So, the problem is, as we discussed, that time story is not of an infection. If he had a rapidly progressive jaundice due to infection, he would have been vomiting and a lot of all those symptoms would have been there, right? See, so that acute, acute hepatitis where jaundice is worsening, his hepatocyte functioning is worsening. And at that stage with fastly progressive, he could have gone into an acute liver cell failure. But they decided to get home. So it was a naturally recovering though partially recovering. So my question is, what can recover partially but not completely? And the answers are only two, immune or metabolic. Okay, this is not infection. Okay, now we have not settled down whether it's a hepatic or biliary, but the kind of sudden worsening is unlikely a biliary, because what is the biliary problem, congenital? Biliary atresia, etc. Out. Could it be positive of bile ducts, allegally, but that doesn't come with severe jaundice and may come little later. So congenital malformations are unlikely. Could it be stone that could be severe pain, etc. Okay. Could it be any inspissated bile in the bile duct, CF doing it? No, it's a hepatocyte disease worsening. So possibly this is not going to be a biliary problem by itself. And this is going to be an immunological or metabolic. Both can do this, okay. But it's a long story, so we don't know uh, which one can still be there. For example, look at a Wilson disease, a very wide spectrum of presentation from an acute liver failure, failure in few days to almost asymptomatic hepatomegaly with very mild bilirubin rise, not even perceptible in the eyes. So we have a wide spectrum. Same thing immune. Now we don't know during these seven months there has been a little up and down but not severely. Okay. It could have gone down a little, up a little and the parents were used to it. So they did not. So one would have asked that when the whole skin was yellow, did the skin clear it off over time and the eyes remain? Did the urine getting dark was less dark, clear sometime? Then we would have got the story whether it was totally recovering, coming again and that could have been a colidocal cyst for all that you know. But no, jaundice is very severe and progressing very fast, so very unlikely. And therefore, the dysfunction between them. Just to summarize simply, all liver diseases of acute onset, okay, are either infection, immune or metabolic. And you have to fit them in somewhere. And all of them have a very wide spectrum that you cannot bet one or another. And whenever I have discussed with hepatologists, they don't discuss clinically at all. They said, we'll do all the tests. I said, why do you do all the tests? Tell me, what is your clinical impression? They say, clinically, it could be anything. Now, of course, those who know much more feel it could be anything, okay. Those who know little are more confident, no, no, it is this only. Both of us are wrong in one way or another. They keep on thinking anything is possible, that is totally wrong. We are confident, no, nothing. That also is not right. So, enough to say, possibly, could it be a chronic hepatitis with up and down, chronic B, chronic C? A fast progression rule set out. Most of the time, hepatitis B and C is a chronic disorder. Acute is known, but otherwise chronic. And therefore, if it's a chronic persistent infection of the hepatocyte, there would be some element of failure to thrive, going down in weight. So we would like to know that as well. Whereas it's an immune, then in between you are all right. You could be still doing fairly well in terms of health status. So I think the point is, when we discuss such thing, we would have asked many questions on the history. 
But if we did not think of many things, then we would say whatever the parents have given is all right, and we will ask like an undergraduate, yes, one, two, three, four, and that's enough. So I think that's where it is there. Now, there is an itching all over the body. Does it not mean it's a biliary? Itching all over the body. What do you think? Even post conjugation in a hepatic disease. At so uh, severe hepatic disease also has itching. The question is, is it maintained or it has been there some time? Again, the details need to be looked into that. If it is retained, then a severe jaundice has retained. And if it's a hepatocyte, it can't retain severe jaundice for a long time. It would either fail or get better. Then whether it's a biliary again. But we are not very clear. The point is, a good history comes after starting to give a thought while taking a history. Woman, he said, jaundice, acute onset. He said, what's the urine color, what's the stool color? Direct. Hepatic, mild jaundice, severe illness. Biliary, severe jaundice, less illness. Okay, broad, broad differences. And then go about doing that, right? Anyway, let's see. My last question before, she, before he shows further is, would the physical examination tell us anything more than what we have discussed? In which case we are convinced physical examination is useless. History is good enough. What do you think? Hepatomegaly or uh, the and severity of jaundice. We want to know hepatomegaly. We want to know subtle dysfunctions of the liver besides jaundice. Maybe edema. Okay. Maybe weight is going down. Maybe some behavior changes. We don't know. So, we will have to look at that. Let's see. No history of clay colour stools, no history of abdominal distension. Yeah, this we have done. Okay. So, tell us the, your impression. Ah, no. Nine-year-old female child with chief complaints of yellow discoloration since seven months in a known case of aortic stenosis, who is developmentally normal, immunized till date, is most probably a chronic liver disease, secondary to Wilson disease, autoimmune hepatitis, hep B, hep C. Anthropometry, weight 19 kg, less than minus 3 standard deviation, height 122 centimeters, minus 3 to minus 2 standard deviation, BMI 12.8, minus 3 to minus 2 standard deviation. Okay, wait one minute. So, how old is this child? Nine. So, what's your interpretation? Is weight affected? Is height affected? Weight is affected? Weight to height ratio is also affected, sir. Uh, weight is less than three standard deviation. Uh, so the child is uh, malnourished. Height is also. See, we have all discussed this many times that when you say less than three standard deviations, we know it's affected. But we want to know how badly it is affected. So how do you know that? One simple way is to know the weight age. So what is the weight age of this child? 19 kg is normal weight at what age? Five and a half, six. Okay. So that is the weight age of this child. What is the height age? 122 is normal at what age? Eight to nine years. Eight. Eight to nine. So eight, eight and a half. So, your interpretation is that weight is definitely affected, height depending on various other factors like parental, birth, this, that, either it is low normal or it is beginning to get affected, right? That's your interpretation. So, only that minus 3 SD doesn't tell you the whole story because what I mean is for concept understand that it is not minus 10 SD or it is not minus 7 SD. You don't know. Everything is minus 3 SD. Right? So, you need to know that by weightage and heightage. Yeah. Go on. 
So now at this point of time, how would you know whether this is just a familial stature, it's genetic, or is it sickness that we are talking about? Because the weight is much low, the height is near normal, it could be a familial stature. monitor with growth velocity for the next six months. So you would like to know whether the child is sick or very active and happy and healthy. Okay, just because weight is slow doesn't mean you are sick. Okay, but if weight is low and you are normal, then you are energetic, you are active, you are happy, you are eating well, everything is normal. So that is the way you could have said, oh, this is a chronic liver disease, he is not well. Is he playing well? Is, okay, all those routines. So personal history at that stage would tell us whether this child's low weight is just a familial pattern or a disease by itself, because the height is quite okay, right? Head to do examination. Deep uterus all over the body, grade 3 clubbing present. No other signs of liver failure. On examination, A febrile, uterus plus paler present, heart rate around 94 per minute, respiratory around 24 per minute, saturation 98 percentage, peripheral pulse well fed, extremities warm. Systemic examination per abdomen, superficial palpation, no rise in temperature, no tenderness, no guarding, no rigidity. Deep palpation, liver palpable 5 cm below the left coastal margin, firm inconsistency, well defined border, smooth surface. Liver span around 9 cm, spleen not palpable. Other system examination, CVS, uh, grade 2 ejection system burma present, respiratory system air entry bilaterally equals, central nervous system tone power reflex normal. Impression. Okay. Wait, wait. So what do you make out of this now? On clinical examination, what have you got or what have you not got? Um, apart from uh, icterus clubbing means other signs of liver failure like there is no ascites or any coagulopathy, palmar erythema. Uh. So do, do we need signs of failure only all the time? So you would say even there are no other signs of liver dysfunction, okay? So that's one. Then is the liver abnormal or normal? Abnormal. Why? Consistency. Form in consistency and enlarged. So you have an abnormal liver, okay? What about clubbing? What does that tell you? Hmm. So, in which Could liver disease do you get clubbing? Long-standing cirrhosis. Chronic duration of illness is... Okay. So, now what, what would you say? Is the hepatocyte function besides the jaundice, is the hepatocyte function affected or not affected in this child? Does he have portal hypertension? No. Why doesn't he have portal hypertension? No splenomegaly. And no ascites. No ascites. No hematomesis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is hepatocyte function affected? Yes. Deep huh? Deep ectris is still present. So that could be just biliary, no? But if you are attributing the clubbing to be due to uh, the liver cause, then there has to be long-standing cirrhosis for that to give rise to clubbing. So then that hepatocyte dysfunction has to be present for So why is it not showing in terms of edema, ascites, portal hypertension? Means it's still compensated. Okay. I think severe jaundice in a hepatocyte disease indicates a very extensively damaged liver. Okay. Your 80-85% of the liver has to be damaged before even a jaundice comes. And here, the jaundice is very severe. So imagine, entire hepatocytes are damaged. Even then, the remaining functions are fairly normal. The earliest function which is disturbed is edema feet. 
hypoalbuminemia. Probably this child does not have that also. But all that happens before jaundice comes up. Because in the process of a hepatocyte damage, you can pick up hypoalbuminemia first. If it's an acute liver damage, you can even pick up a bleeding disorder first, even an encephalopathy first, before even jaundice. Imagine the Reyes syndrome, acute hepatic encephalopathy, no jaundice. So acutely progressive liver disease without jaundice can have liver dysfunction. And a chronic progressive liver disease starts with first hypoalbuminemia, then jaundice. Because hypoalbuminemia can come up with even 50% of hepatocytes gone down. Whereas for bilirubin it takes a long time, a, a large number of hepatocytes. Here there is a severe jaundice and even then there is no edema. So possibly it's a primary biliary disease. Okay. And why large liver in a biliary disease? And now you get an answer why clubbing? And therefore, radicals involved. Yeah. So basically primary biliary primary biliary disease leading to a firm liver. So what is known as biliary cirrhosis. Biliary cirrhosis. Diagnosis is a biliary cirrhosis. Now the question is, what's the cause of a biliary disease? So again if we go back, in hepatocytes we said immune, etc. and we started discussing hepatocyte disease. But on examination, I know hepatocytes have been involved after the biliary tract started getting first. And therefore, it's a biliarohepatic disease, not hepatobiliary disease in that strict order. Then what kind of biliary disorder it must be? But like hepatocyte disease, I said, infection, immune, and uh, metabolic. When it comes to biliary, you would also bring in a metabolic abnormalities, like biliary uh, bile salt deficiencies, okay, sclerosing cholangitis, immune, one of you said earlier, sclerosing cholangitis, congenital malformation. So all those come in. What we said that jaundice has been up and down maybe because they went home with severe jaundice but have come back again with severe jaundice. So it's immune. So possibly a diagnosis of a sclerosing cholangitis looks a reasonably one, okay. Just based on that, but all that we know is that starting point was severe jaundice. The seven months later, admission shows severe jaundice. In between, I imagine there must have been improvement. That's why they stayed quiet at home. And therefore, I will bring the immunological disorder. The metabolic disorder is out because it's not a biliary disease except the bile acid metabolism defect which is extremely rare. Wilson is far more common, but that's hepatocyte disease. So I think that's where we may end up with, right? Has, have some investigation been done? Yeah. Sir, uh, CBC, uh, HBO is around uh, 7.1, counts for around 20,000, platelets uh, 2,70,000. MC was 88.2, retic count for 5.6 percentage. Then uh, liver function test, total bilis is around uh, 26.4, direct bilis is 18.4, and uh, OTPT is 256, 140. Total protein is 7.5, albumin is 3.1. Then uh, UHG suggestive of uh, mild splenomegaly, liver echo structure was normal. Sir. And, uh, Hepatitis B, Hepatitis C was negative, so I have not mentioned. Then the stuff all in the uh, awaited, the seroloplasmin. We have sent, sir. Seroloplasmin is awaited. Awaited. So, 24 hours, you can is awaited. And uh, the coagulation profile, PT, PTT, all that is also normal? Uh, that was normal, sir. Normal. PT is normal, sir. So, liver function essentially is normal. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Mild uh, enzyme raised, OTPT mildly raised, you said, no? Yes, sir. 256. 256 and 140. So, very, very minimal. Yes, sir. Okay. 
and how is the child otherwise like appetite activity sir, all appetite that was good activity is good sir appetite is good appetite is good sir volunteer is good activity is good gct is not done gt is not done sir same 24 child is here child was there sir but uh, they went away, they went away. Okay. i think if the child is apparently normal with so much of derangement possibly not a hepatocyte and if that is so not a wilsons okay mm-hmm. and to that extent we will still push ourselves on a biliary tract disease and ggt might have been specifically alkaline phosphate is also at this age actually ggt is 24 report has come just now so 24 is normal no low or normal so it's normal range so you will have to uh, consider one of those pfix also the pfix really are hepatocyte disorders basically and the enzyme should have been high jaundice is so severe okay and still the other liver functions are normal that looks very unusual and as we said that liver functions go worsening the jaundice worsening is a later stage before hepatocellular failure so enzyme should have been high okay unless the child is deteriorating and enzymes have gone down but bilirubin is increasing is Sir. that possible what i mean is typical hepatitis there is a jaundice there is an ast alt high okay when child is worsening child is worsening so jaundice is going up but the enzymes are coming down so it's like last stage of liver disease is it possible in this child is why, it true why was it possible no, enzymes are not being dis- synthesized enzymes are not being synthesized the enzymes are going down no 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 we are asking is that situation in this child possible so what's your answer a other functions child. are well preserved like ptinr coagulopathy it would have been a sick looking uh, child total protein alpha and ptinr coagulopathy and sir no signs of portal hypertension aside albumin. albumin albumin is bang uh, normal no so how can it be a end stage liver disease and enzymes go down in an end stage liver disease because they are intracellular enzymes and hepatocytes are all dying so there is no intracellular enzyme remaining so alt ast go down but the patient is worsening and patient is worsening in terms of all liver function including encephalopathy bleeding so this is not that if the patient is happy with all that it has to be really not a primary hepatocyte disease but let us know next time what it is we we are just discussing based on clinical judgment and we like to know each time whether our discussion was totally out of focus then we will learn from it okay and that's important okay so uh, a person concerned should tell us next time without so fail so gokula you have to tell you us next time what is us. the follow up of this you don't want us to know what mistakes we are doing you never come back i know you you are very very humble towards us not even expose our mistakes and say no 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 how can you but we want you to do that because then only we also will learn and there is no shame in our being wrong but we are able to justify what we are saying after all both the parties in the court of law justify as if they are strong in their judgment still the judgment comes only in favor of one so we are doing the same and you must tell us what next time even if you tell us oh nothing came out at least we know that we were close to that nothing came out means something would have come out later right good sir actually for this patient we are thinking of uh, already congenital asd is already there so any ca- chronic congestive hepatopathy can be there but on 2d co ra rv is normal asd means a- a- Sorry, a- aortic stenosis as- no? aortic stenosis is there so that has no connection to the liver as far as i know secondly again for congestive uh, hepatopathy the bilirubin is disproportionately high and uh, the 
you know it can't just remain congested for so many and months sir, without there are no other signs of congestion or ccf like uh, dyspnea breathlessness patient Sorry. has patient has no other complaints of congestive cardiac failure yeah and besides like in a congestive hepatopathy what your bilirubin will be say four five six types not 25 i think the only way you can connect aortic stenosis with all this is there is a syndromic problem yes it's likely after all we know an allegally has a cardiac problem sir actually so we read ki we do not know what syndrome 2 to 3% of allergy yeah. can present at this age yeah so, so that's what so it could still be a syndrome with some syndromic variation syndromic and a congenital malformation in a biliary tract and that's why static or mildly varying but the health not getting upset it's possible and there must be allegally is what we know a commoner syndrome out of rare but there must be many rare conditions and i think we must hunt for such combination you might get somewhere somebody has talked about the syndrome but we are not aware of it but one possibility to my mind is syndromic abnormality in a biliary tract right okay thank you so we stop the class here today and we meet once again on next thursday uh once again to make it clear that for a few weeks there is no live webcast of these classes so the recorded versions will be available to see and for all mumbai students we request that you come here in person because the learning is better we thank the authorities at sain hospital for conducting these classes and we thank aristo for an academic grant which uh, allows the live webcast presently the live webcast is not happening because the hall is under renovation thank you very much